Charles in here. J'ai oublié le, le planning, il y a une heure, ensuite une petite pause et deuxième heure, c'est ça Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Philippe for uh, inviting me here. Uh, so I want to tell you about um, computational aspects of Euclidean lattices. And I'm a bit, I'm a bit embarrassed because my, my topic is, is much simpler compared to, to, other, to other lectures. So, so to compensate, I put this uh, picture, which is not mine. Do you know what is this picture? Have you seen this picture before? Yeah. Ah, exactly. <laughs> excellent, excellent. And for the record, I didn't pay you. <laughs> you did this, this thing. So yeah, this is R2. This is an embedding of R2 divided by V square. So. so when people in the audience say sorry, not that audible on Zoom. Ah, okay. So I want to repeat that this this picture is a is a C1 isometric uh, a C1 embedding of the flat torus R square divided by Z square. <coughs> And this was done by a team of, of, of French people 10 years ago. It's very nice. All right, so what I want to do is I, I want to give you um, a flavor of what I'm going to talk about. And then I will uh, talk about lattice problems. And then I will introduce a, a very classical algorithm by now, which is the LL algorithm. But there are um, surprising things which have been discovered in the past few years about this LL algorithm. So I will, I will tell you a little bit about it. And then I will describe a related algorithms. One is the so-called Babai algorithm, and then something which is quite popular as a tool for cryptographers is discrete Gaussian sampling, and that's connected to some interesting uh, mathematics. And if the time allows it, uh, I will talk about worst case to average case reduction, so to explain what it is. Uh, however, I may, I may be too confident, so I have downloaded this, uploaded the slides, but I'm not sure uh, I will have enough time. We'll see. So what kind of things am I going to talk about? So what I want to say is that there's been a, from a computational point of view, there's really been a lot of progress in the, in the tractability of lattice problems. So for instance, um, if ever you encounter a lattice in practice, you should be aware that most lattice problems, even the hardest one, are very, I mean, somewhat easy today if the rank of the lattice is less than, say, 100. So of course, if the rank is much bigger, you may not be able to do it. And if it's really high, you're unlikely to do it. However, it's good to know that if the rank is sufficiently small, you can pretty much do anything you want. So for instance, it's possible to find nearly shortest vectors in a lattice if the rank is less than, say, 180. And if you don't believe me, there's a website called the um, SVP Challenge website that gives you uh, records computation. So for instance, here is 
a 180 rank lattice where people found a non-zero vector whose norm is less than 1.04 times the shortest length, okay? So that's in dimension 180. This uses significant power, but it's doable, okay? So this is comparable. I think it would be less. It's a fraction of what you used for factoring challenges, okay? So if you're interested to know what is possible, there's a couple of websites where you can download lattices and you can see how much we can do in practice. And a few years ago, it was even better. You could download these lattices and get some money if you find the shortest vector or the closest vectors. But nowadays, this has been removed, so you can only do it for, for the sake of science. So if you just want to have your name on a, on a website, then you can do it. Okay. Another thing that happened in the, last, in the past 10 years is we've seen a lot of uh, uh, wide uses of this lattice algorithm to problems which a priori have no relationship to lattices. So to, to give you a concrete example, five years ago there was a famous attack that appeared on smart cards. It's called the Roca attack found by uh, Czech Republic researchers. And what they show that it's possible to factor RSA keys produced by uh, some manufacturer in Fineon. And for instance, uh, the million identity cards uh, used by Estonia were vulnerable. So I think the cost was about $10,000 per card. You could recover the secret key of one identity card. So if you have enough money, you can do it for the whole country. But you have to pay about $10,000 for, for each identity card. So what do you do? You have a large RSA number, so just a product of two large primes. So that's, in general, if there's no special property for the prime numbers, that's very difficult. However, these cards had a very special uh, prime generation. And it turned out that each of the prime number, instead of being uniformly distributed modulo small primes, as it should be, it, were, it belonged to the, um, to the subgroup generated by 65,537. So that's the only information, side channel information that you had. You knew that each prime number here was a power of this number modulo many small primes. Okay. And that was enough to turn this problem, factoring problem, into a lattice problem. And they used the algorithm to recover, to recover such keys. Okay. So even if you don't like lattices, maybe in your work, maybe you will need to find a short vector in a lattice or find a, a closed vector in a lattice. So you had some, some lectures already uh, on lattices, but because lattice is such a simple object, uh, there are different notations between people, so I want to, uh, to give a, a small uh, recap on my own notation. So for me, I will talk only about Euclidean lattices. So I view uh, RTDN as Euclidean space. So I have my, my inner product, and this is how I'm going to write the norm. And for me, a lattice is going to be uh, any subgroup of the space, of the Euclidean space, which is discrete for the topology induced by, by, by the inner product. So what does it mean? It means that for any point in the lattice, I can find some ball that isolates the point. So that's this, right? And I will talk about rank. The rank of the lattice will be the dimension of the linear span of the lattice. So with this definition, the simplest example of a lattice would be Zn. So Zn is obviously a, a, a subgroup. And it's obviously discrete. And any subgroup of Zn would be, uh, would be also a, a, a lattice for that definition. So sometimes some people only consider full rank lattices. Here I'm considering any discrete subgroup of R to the n. So as you know, there's a, there's a characterization of lattices of discrete subgroup of R to the n, such that um, we know that L is a lattice if and only if there exist linearly independent vectors over the vector space, such that the lattice is the set of all the linear combination of those vectors with integer coefficients. Okay, so in that case, I call 
such a set of vectors a basis of the lattice, and the rank is exactly the number of elements of these bases. And as we know, bases are not unique, so here are green vectors, here are red vectors, here are blue vectors. If I take all the integer linear combination of these vectors, I get exactly the same set. Okay. So for computers, we actually do not work with uh, these directly with these lattices. Instead, we restrict to integer lattices, which are just any subgroup of the hypercubic lattice, z to the n. Okay. And one thing which is fundamental is if I take a, uh, a full rank sublattice of Zn, there's a very special thing. The, the quotient Zn to, divided by L is a finite abelian group. So it's, a, it's some kind of to discrete torus. And this is the group which is very important in cryptography. So in cryptography, we only work with this kind of lattices. And we actually work with this finite, finite group. All right, so we have. We, have, uh, we agree on the definition, so I need a few more very basic tools. So I'm going to introduce duality, Gram-Schmidt, and co-volumes. So remember that the, the dual lattice is just the set of vectors in the linear span of the lattice, such that the inner product is an integer for any lattice vector. Okay, so it's a it's an elementary exercise to show that this is indeed a lattice. That's indeed a subgroup, a discrete subgroup of R to the N. And you can show that the rank of those two lattices are identical. Okay, so the primal and the dual lattice have the same rank. It's always good in a, in a lecture to have some examples. So to, to get used to this uh, dual lattice, for instance, you could take a very simple lattice Let's take an integer matrix and consider the kernel of that matrix mod Q. Okay, so I'll, I'll look at all the linear combination of these rows, which are congruent to zero mod Q. And then you can see it's a subgroup of Z to the N. So it's a full rank, it's even a full rank lattice in Z to the N. And so this is wrong because I, I didn't define the volume yet. But you can see what is the dual lattice of this, this, this lattice, and you can see that the dual lattice is this lattice. Okay. So it's just an exercise to uh, get used to the dual lattice. Okay. How about Gram-Schmidt? So Gram-Schmidt is a very, very central tool for computational aspects of lattices. So you take any, um, any set of vectors in the space, and you define its Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization as follows: the first vector is the is the initial vector, and for each vector, you're going to project the ith vector over the subspace orthogonal to the previous vectors. Okay. So this would be uh, so here is going to be uh, b1, b2. So this is b2 star, and this is b3 star. So that's a very elementary tool to show the existence of orthogonal bases in Euclidean spaces. So in, in general, in lattices, we don't have orthogonal bases, but this will be very useful to quantify how good a basis can be. So this Gram-Schmidt uh, family is orthogonal by construction. And you can see that they the Gram-Schmidt vectors span the same subspaces than the initial family. And geometrically, the norm of the Gram-Schmidt vector is just the distance of the i vector with respect to the subspace spanned by the previous vectors. Okay. And there's a relationship with duality. You can notice that the last Gram-Schmidt vector, if you normalize it like this, you see that it's a, it's a dual lattice vector. So why is it? You can see that it's orthogonal to all the previous vectors. And the inner product with Bn is an integer by construction. So therefore, it belongs to the dual lattice. So one thing which is often confusing, the, the Gram-Schmidt uh, family is not a basis. It's not a basis of the lattice. It's only a basis of the linear span. However, this last Gram-Schmidt vector is connected to the dual lattice. 
So that allows me to, uh, to define gram determinant. So the gram determinant is just the determinant of, of, uh, of the inner products. And the relationship with the Gram-Schmidt is that it's, it's also the product of the square Gram-Schmidt norms. Okay? So it's an elementary fact that if you take a basis, the Gram determinant of the basis does not depend on the basis itself, on the choice of basis. It only depends on the lattice. Okay. So that's why the, the square root of this Gram determinant is called the co-volume of the lattice. Okay? So this, in, in my picture, it corresponds to the... Uh, to the area of this pyrogram here, which is the same as this red pyrogram. So for instance, the volume, the co-volume of Zn is, is one, and it's an exercise to show that the product of the primal lattice with the dual lattice, the co-volume are equal to one, okay? All right. So since we, we want to deal with computational aspects, I think uh, the first example should be how to compute Gram-Schmidt. Okay, so how do we compute Gram-Schmidt? So we take these vectors, and we know that the Gram-Schmidt vector is non-zero if the vectors are linear independent. And obviously we want to decompose over an orthogonal family, so we define this, this coefficient mu ij, which is uh, the, the, these inner products divided by the square norm, so that this formula holds. Okay, so this is a way to decompose the basis vectors with respect to the Gram Schmidt family. Okay. So if I want to know these Gram Schmidt vectors, it suffices to know to compute this mu ij. Okay. So you see there are some elementary induction formula. You can see that because, because the, the, the bi star are orthogonal, I can express the, the square norm of bi with respect to the Gram-Schmidt norms, and I get this formula. And if I re-inject in my previous definition here, if I re-inject uh, the other vectors inside, I get this induction formula. So you can see that if I know the first mu ij, I can compute the next mu ij, and I can also compute the Gram-Schmidt norm. Okay, so that gives me, a, that gives me a, a basic recursive algorithm to compute all of uh, these Gram-Schmidt decomposition. But that doesn't mean that it's efficient, right? So we need to, to do some more work uh, if we want, we want to make sure that we're doing cheap operation on reasonably sized numbers, okay? So, so far, there's really nothing fancy yet. I just developed my formula I was forced to work with. So remember, we only deal in practice with integer vectors, so we can ask ourselves what happens to all these quantities. Uh, so you can see, it's not difficult to see that actually this mu ij uh, and the square Gram-Schmidt norms are all rational. And the Gram-Schmidt vectors them themselves are rational vectors. Okay. But rational arithmetics is not so nice in practice, so we'd like to avoid it. We'd like to see, can, can we do everything just with integer arithmetic? So for that, what we do is that we use the Gram determinant. So the Gram determinant uh, are integer. So we call it the di. And that's because my, my vectors are integer vectors. Okay? And we can see they're not too big. We can bound them with respect to the maximal norm of the initial vectors. So one thing we, we would like to do is first we'd like to compute we could compute in point more time, obviously, by definition of the Gram determinant, all these, all these integers, okay? So now the question is, if I compute all these integers, can I now therefore compute a representation of this rational efficiently? So that's the integral Gram-Schmidt. So if I take my previous numbers, it's, it's easy to, to show that 
bi star multiplied by one of these numbers belongs to the lattice spanned by b1 bi. So that's an integer vector because my, my basis vector are integer. All right. So that means that I have found a denominator of the rational vector bi star. So I found a nice representation of my rational vector with a bounded numerator as well. So both my numerator and my denominator are nice. Okay. Similarly, I can do the same thing with the mu ij. I can see that this dj is a denominator for the rational mu ij, and the numerator is bounded, polynomially bounded. Okay. So now I see that there is a way to represent these rational quantities with integers, with reasonably sized integers, okay? So how do you prove it? There are many ways to prove a simple thing. I just want to give you one argument based on duality. So what you can see that if I, if I denote by L, L, L cross the dual lattice of this lattice, then by definition, this quotient is finite, and its index is exactly di, okay? But remember, when I introduced the Gram-Schmidt vector, I said the last Gram-Schmidt vector divided by the square norms is a dual lattice vector, right? But this is a finite quotient group. Therefore, if I multiply this guy by the index, I get a vector in the primal lattice. Right? And saying this is exactly saying this. Right? So I prove that di minus 1 times the gram schmidt vector is, belongs to the lattice span by the first i vectors. And therefore, it's an integer vector. Okay. So now that we have this lemma, now we can have a computation. So now we just have to transform my uh, induction formula with respect to integers. So I'm doing like this. I know the denominator, so I can rewrite everything just with integers to avoid rational arithmetic. Okay. So that gives me uh, an integer representation of the mu ij by, by using the so-called lambda ij. And usually this is enough. Usually for all our algorithms, we're happy to only compute the di and the lambda ij. If we really wanted to know concretely, explicitly, the, the gram sheet vectors, we could do that, but it's usually not needed. Okay? So if for you, you really need to, uh, to, to know this bi star, I mean, you could do it. I think so, I tried to search. I don't, is, does Perry compute integer gram -Schmidt? Maybe not, right? They And there's no integer version of LLL inside Perry? Okay. So what did we do? We started with integer vectors. And what we claim is we, can, we show how to compute all the gram determinants efficiently, as well as an integer representation of the gram schmidt decomposition. Okay, so I can compute these numerators and the denominators of the mu ij. And once I have that, so I can derive, if I want to, explicitly the gram schmidt vectors. And I can also compute the square norm of the gram schmidt vectors as a rational. Exactly. Okay? So why, why is this? Uh, problem useful at all? Well, there's actually many applications you can do once you have these integer quantities. For instance, a very basic question. I give you integer vectors. Can you compute a basis of the lattice generated by the CIs? So what I mean by that is, um, So if I take the set uh, ZC1 plus ZC2, 
plus, and so on. And I took n of them, zcn. So if I consider all the linear combination with integer coefficients of the ci, and here, what is important is that I didn't assume the CIs to be linear independent. So I know that this set is a lattice. It's a subgroup of, Z, of Zm, so it's a lattice. And I ask you, can you find, can you compute a basis of this lattice? Okay. And if you look at this problem, if I take m equal to 1, and if I take n equal to 2, This is exactly finding the GCD of those two numbers, right? C1 and C2 are numbers, because n equal to 1. And you're asking, can you find the GCD of those two numbers? And that's Euclid's algorithm, right? So you're asking, we're asking, is there a vector analog, a higher dimensional analog of Euclid's algorithm? And thanks to this Gram-Schmidt, integer Gram-Schmidt, you can do that. So you can think about this problem. How to, using this Gram Schmidt, how can I do this thing? Yeah. So there is actually an algorithm which is very similar. I mean, it's really the, 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 generalization, the natural generalization of Euclid's algorithm to do this, thanks to Gram Schmidt. Okay. Another question you might ask yourself is a very basic question. I give you a vector, an integer vector. Can you decide if it belongs to the lattice? So now that you know a basis of that lattice, can you ask uh, if it's in the lattice? And can you find, if it belongs to, can you find the integer coefficients to decompose the, the, this target? Okay. So again, you can think about it. Thanks to gram schmidt orthogonalization, you can solve this problem in polynomial time. Because if you did not know gram schmidt this is doable, but it's non-trivial. How to show, I mean, how to do it in polynomial time, it's not, it's not so easy. So this Gram Schmidt is a way also to uh, dirty your hands. Okay. So now if I, if, if I don't want to dirty my hands, I can also view it very abstractly. So what am I doing? I could say the following. I take a basis, and you notice if you, if you consider all the lattices generated by the first i vectors, each of them is a sub-lattice. Okay. So, so we have a a sequence of increasing sublattices. So that's called a flag of the lattice. And if you do that, you realize that uh, if i is less than j, because you started with a basis, each quotient can be viewed as a lattice of rank j minus i. Okay. So this gram schmidt decomposition is just a way to implement this quotient. And then the volume of this quotient lattice is just the quotient of the volumes. Okay. So behind each basis, there is a, there is a flag, and there is a, there is a, a sequence of quotient lattices. Okay. So this is the way you can view it. Yes. Yeah. If it's a basis, yeah. But if you take now, if you take arbitrary sub lattice and one is included in the other, you may not view the quotient as a lattice. You may have torsion. No, I'm just saying if you want to implement it, if you want to work with these lattices concretely, then you need some way to represent it, and that's usually you do it with Gram Schmidt. Okay, so we, we can just view as a mathematical object, we don't care about Gram Schmidt. But if you want to play with it, do some computation, then we need we need something. So I just wanted to see both representations so that if you if you prefer to be abstract, then you can deal with this and ignore what I was doing before. Or for some people, they prefer to put their hand inside, and then you, okay. okay. 
So which brings me to this uh, another classical problem, counting lattice points. So I'm just going to remind you some, some things. So uh, if I take so the, this volume that we've defined, it's, uh, it measures the density of lattice point. And we have this very uh, famous heuristic that says that if you take a nice lattice, if you take a nice subset of R to the N, you would expect that the intersection between the lattice and the set has about uh, volume of the set divided by the co-volume of the lattice, many points. Okay, so you can see here, this would be a nice set. Each parallelogram has area the co-volume. And yes, it makes sense that I would expect the number of points to be approximately this. Okay. So what is a nice set? Imagine that the ball is a nice set. So it's a very, uh, it's an undergrad exercise to compute the volume of the Euclidean ball. And it's related to the gamma function. So if I play with my methodics of volumes, you see that uh, I, can, I can evaluate the number of points inside a ball, right? Is it true? So you can see that for certain lattices, even nice lattices like Zn, if I take a bad ball, if I take a small ball but not too small, then you can see that this heuristic fails completely. You have an exponential error. Okay. However, if I take an arbitrary large ball, for instance, you can see that the heuristic is correct. Uh, so as the radius grows to infinity, if there, then the Gaussian heuristic holds for this ball, okay? And still, if I believe in this heuristic, it tells me, thanks to the asymptotics of the volume of a ball, I would expect that square root of d times the d root of the co-volume is the first hole from which you would find lattice points, okay? And that turns out to be provable. So it's a classical result to say that any d-dimensional lattice has exponentially many vectors of norm less than some constant time uh, the d root times the square root of d. And this bound is, uh, is optimal in the random case. So you could build easily lattices for which the shortest vector is much smaller than this bound, but it would not happen for a random lattice. Okay? So in the random lattice, all the non-zero vectors have norm bigger than this. Okay, so there's just a constant difference. If you increase the constant, you have exponentially vectors. If it's too small, you have zero vectors. Okay. So this brings naturally to the uh, notion of first minimum. So the intersection of a lattice with any bounded set is finite because uh, the lattice is a discrete subgroup. So there are vectors of minimal norm, and the, this minimal norm is called the first minimum, lambda 1. Okay. Yeah? Ah, very good question. So I will say a, few, a bit more about this random lattice a bit after. But for, for now, you could just say, OK, there is a notion of random lattice. But it's quite involved, so I will tell you more about it a bit later. But at this point, I don't want to say. I'm just going to say, imagine there's a, there's a notion of random lattice. There's a theorem that says a random lattice has this property. So you can also say most lattices are like this, intuitively. Okay. All right, so Hermit, Hermit showed uh, in 1850, that this ratio is bounded independently of the lattice. So just depending on the dimension of the rank of the lattice, I can upper bound this ratio. And this really corresponds to the worst case. So there are lattices for which this is maximum. And that corresponds to Hermit constant. Okay. And what I said before was studying the random case. Okay. What can we say about this quantity? for a random lattice. And this tells you what happens in the worst case. Okay. So what did, did Hermit really show? So he showed 
this exponential bound on, on his constant. Okay? And the first result of Minkowski was to show that this upper bound was, uh, was, was not the truth. So there was a much better bound. There was a linear bound on, on hermit constant, so which what we said by before with uh, the exponentially many lattice vectors. Okay? So now you can see any lattice contains a non-zero vector of less than square root of d. And in fact, it contains exponentially many vectors if you put a constant here. All right, so now we're going to talk about reduced basis. I want to give an intuition about what it is. So I mentioned before when I, when I recap Gram-Schmidt that Euclidean spaces have orthogonal basis. Lattices have, unfortunately, no reduced basis, uh, no uh, orthogonal basis, but they have vectors. Uh, they have bases for which all the vectors are short and nearly orthogonal. So let me say something a bit strange. If you take an integer lattice, actually any integer lattice has an orthogonal family. So you can find uh, y you, have a, you have a set of linear independent lattice vectors, which are pairwise orthogonal in any integer lattice. But this orthogonal family is not a basis in general. So it's strange. We, we have an orthogonal family, but we don't have an orthogonal basis. So instead, what we have is this reduced basis. So, so far, I've not defined precisely what it means. I'll just say intuitively, you, would, you could believe that this is a non-reduced basis, like this green one. And you could believe that this balance coefficients matrix is reduced. Okay? So that would correspond to, say, the, the red basis here. OK. So enough about my notation. Now I can finally move to hard lattice problems. <coughs> so as I said before, we only work with integer lattices. So the way, the natural way to represent an integer lattice would take an integer matrix. So if I take an integer matrix, there are two things that, that interest me, the size of the coefficients and the dimensions of the matrix. If we think about complexity theory, we need to uh, we need to parameter. So the main parameter is going to be the dimension of the lattice, and we do, we're going to assume that the, um, the coefficients are polynomial in the dimension. So if the coefficients are super small, the problem might become too easy. Okay, so we're going to assume that they they grow reasonably. Okay, but not too big. You could imagine some lattice problems for which if the lattice has a small, say, a very small covolume, then the problem is no longer hard, even for the dimension increases. So if your covolume is too small, everything becomes easy independently of how hard is the, is the core problem. Okay. So, so far, I've not defined exactly what is yet the, this hard lattice problem. I'm just going to do a main, main properties from a complexity point of view. Okay? So you may not be familiar with complexity vocab, so I'll just say very intuitively what it means. So all these lattice problems, they come as approximation problem. Okay? There's an approximation factor to relax the problems. So what we know is basically when the approximation factor is very small, the problems are very hard, as hard as the hardest problem in computer science. So we don't expect them to be solved efficiently. However, we have hope. So the hope is, as soon as you increase the approximation factor, the, uh, the complexity properties vary. So for instance, we know that for once we reach square root of the rank of the, of the lattice, there might be hope to find a polynomial time algorithm. If we even uh, more flexible, if we go to a quasi-linear factor, we have some very strange property. We have a worst case, we have a worst case reduction. So I will explain later what it is, what it means. And if we 
if we're able to make a leap of faith, if we assume that these problems remain hard for some polynomial approximation factor, we can do very efficient cryptography. Okay. So for instance, cryptography resistance against quantum computers or other things we can do if we believe that these problems are hard. However, if we take too much risk, if we go to a sub-exponential factor, we can do, uh, we have efficient, somewhat efficient algorithms. And for almost exponential factor, we have really efficient algorithm, like the LLL algorithm, okay? So what is the typical lattice problem? So I would say the typical lattice problem is the following. You take a lattice, you take a ball, so defined by a point and a radius, and you want to decide if the intersection is non-trivial, okay? And if it's trivial, you want to find a point, any point in the intersection. So if you think about it, this problem is easy if you take the hypercubic lattice. And surprisingly, as soon as you deform this hypercubic lattice to a general lattice, it becomes very hard. So the switch from having an orthogonal basis to having just a, a, a reduced basis makes it very complicated. So depending on how, how, uh, what is the radius of the ball and where the ball is located, you, you could have two settings. Maybe the intersection has many points. And you just need to find one. Okay. So that's the, uh, the approximate setting. Or you have a very special ball for which there's only one non-trivial point. So you didn't, this is not a random ball you're taking. It's a very special ball. And still, so you want to find that uh, non-trivial point. Okay. So. so that's a generic problem. So you know, it comes in many flavors. So for the shortest vector problem. Shortest vector problem would be, I give you a lattice. Can you find a vector, a lattice vector of minimal Euclidean norm. So I give you this matrix. Can you find a linear combination of these rows that have the minimal Euclidean norm? So that's exactly what happens to this website I gave you at the beginning. You download this huge matrix, not this, this kind of coefficient, and you need to solve this problem. Okay, so here would be the green vector. So this is very hard. So we want to relax it, so you could ask, Instead of asking for the shortest vector, just ask for a vector whose norm is not too far from lambda 1. Or say, not too far from the diff root of the volume. Okay? A related problem is the closest vector problem, where we add to the lattice a target vector in this linear span. And I'm asking you, can you find the lattice point minimizing the distance to the target with respect to the Euclidean norm, okay? So that's the closest vector problem. The name says it all. There is a, an easy or an easier version of this problem. It's bounded distance decoding. It's this problem, except that I promise you that this target vector is not far from the lattice. So it's not going to be a random point. It's going to be a point fairly close to one of the lattice points. Okay. So typically, it is obtained by selecting a, run, a lattice point, adding some noise, and that's your uh, BDD instance. Okay. So one thing which might be uh, problematic when you find this problem, the first thing that you tell from a practical point of view is, how do you generate instances of these problems, right? From before, I mean, you could ask, how am I going to choose a lattice? If I take close CVP, how am I going to choose this target vector? If I consider BDD, how am I going to choose the noise? Which lattice point am I going to take? And which, um, which noise am I going to take, okay? So when you talk about it's not too complicated to say, how am I going to select uh, random prime numbers? But here, there are so many ways to choose an integer lattice. Which distribution should we target? And similarly for this uh, closest vector business. 
Okay. So now I want to, dis to um, discuss how to choose a lattice. So finally, I'm going to say a few things about what is a random. Okay. So Siegel, in 1945, he realized that there's a natural notion of random lattices, which is related to a Haar measure. Okay. So I'm going to say ju just this thing. If you know the Haar measure, you know what I'm talking about. If you don't know the Haar measure, I don't want to define <laughs> what it is. So um, I already have to, way too many slides. So if you don't know, then just pick it up, Haar measure. It's not, it, it's, it's not that hard. And then you can see uh, what, is, uh, what is the natural uh, measure over, over lattices. Okay. And this, this definition is wonderful. So when I, when I first got into lattices, I didn't know this. Okay? I didn't know this, this old article. And in the textbooks, they don't talk about it. So that's really a shame. Most, uh, most, uh, most textbooks on geometry of numbers don't say anything about this. Okay? But if you read lecture notes from Siegel, which has been uh, re-edited, there's a chapter uh, talking about this. Okay. So what I want to say is not only there is the natural notion of random lattices, there are some very nice properties of random lattices. So here's another result which I wish I knew when I was doing my PhD, uh, um, a result by Rogers. In the 50s, there's a couple, a lot of people studied this, and then it kind of disappeared for a while. So here is a wonderful result by Rogers. He says that if you take these random lattices and you look at the volume of the ball of radius lambda 1 for a random lattice, as the dimension grows to infinity, this converges to the exponential distribution. Okay? So it gives you a very precise behavior of lambda 1. Okay? So it gives you the fluctuation of lambda 1. Uh, for, for random lattices, okay? But unfortunately, these are real lattices, so that doesn't tell me how do I choose an integer lattice, right? So as I said before, if you take a full rank integer lattice, it defines a discrete torus, okay? So what would be natural is to say, how about I select this torus? Can I look at all the lattices that have this quotient. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm looking at the uh, real variable, the volume of the ball. So then it's easy to talk about limit distribution. Yeah. But this only holds for a random lattice. Right? So if you take a, a worst case lattice, lambda 1 could be arbitrarily small. So this does not hold for a peculiar lattice. It only holds for most lattices. Most lattices, lambda 1 is, we, we know what, how it fluctuates over the expected value. So what I didn't say, for instance, these random lattices have um, co-volume 1. So you can always scale whichever lattice you have to have co-volume 1. So this notion of random lattices is for co-volume 1 lattice. So then we know that lambda 1 is, is, is bounded by square root of d. Right? But still, it could fluctuate. So here, it's telling you that lambda 1 is very concentrated for most lattices, for most lattices. So here, if I take integer lattices, you could say, OK, let's, let's fix a finite abelian group and consider all the full rank lattices in ZM such that the torus is isomorphic to G. Okay? So for instance, the co-volume of L must be the cardinal of the order of G. Right? So you can see this, this set of finite. Okay? So if I, if I fix a group, all the integer lattices that has this torus 
they are, th they are finite. They are finitely many. Okay? So, but then, each integer lattice has a quotient, has a torus. So, if I take all these sets, I obtain a partition of full rank lattices. Right? So now a natural thing to say is, well, let's just choose a group and take the uniform distribution over this class. Right? That would be a very natural notion of random integer lattice. Right? Now here is something great. A result uh, from 15 years ago. It says that if you take an inte a random integer lattice uniformly at random from this finite set, if you take any sequence of group of order growing to infinity, then this distribution of integer lattices somewhat converges to the hard distribution of real lattices. So these integer lattices are an approximation of random real lattices. Okay? So this is an ergodic result. Okay? So you can think that this uniform distribution of this finite set is a natural distribution. And if you think, oh, how do I choose my, my groups? I can choose any groups as well as the order grows to infinity. So I know that Bill did an experiment. In, in his slide, he had something like he wanted to show how to use LLL in this thing. So the simplest group you can think of is G equal to uh, ZP. Z divided, divided by prime numbers. And you can see that uh, sampling, sampling from this set is very easy because uh, if you want all the lattices that uh, so the quotient is uh, ZPZ, then you just take, you put P on the diagonal, you put all the, uh, you take random numbers mod P. And you can see that uh, the lattice generated by this give you the uniform distribution. Okay. So they are dominant in this, uh, in this sense. That's exactly what he's doing in his example, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Converge in low. I mean, I have to, I didn't say exactly, but it's a natural. Um, it's really a convergence result. It means something. Yeah. So it, it's a good approximation of uh, of the of the real of the real distribution. It's, it's, a low convergence. it's a low convergence. Yeah. Okay. So now we know how to uh, how to select random lattices, integer lattices, and those are a good approximation of uh, the, real, the real random lattices. All right, so now uh, we're still alive. So now I've, I, I've told you how to select random lattice. Now we can talk about random lattice problems. So once we take this, uh, this distribution, what can we say about these problems? Okay. So here's a great result by Aitai from 1996. So initially, his result was uh, concerning only one type of finite abelian group, which is ZQ to the N. Okay. So we take the same group, okay, and we, we view it as a Z module. Okay. So here's the very, very, this is the simplest problem. You pick M group elements uniformly at random from this finite group, okay, here. And I'm asking you, can you find small integers, xi's, such that the sum of the xi, gi, is equal to zero in the group? So remember, I view g as a z module, so this means, uh, this means the, exter the external law, right? xi, an integer times a group element. So can you add can you add these group elements in such a way that it's equal to zero with small coefficients? 
And obviously, I mean, there is natural bound. There is a solution less than this, for instance. Okay. So this is really a, a group problem. I give you a finite building group. Can you find a small linear combination equal to the zero element? Right? But now that you've seen this connection with lattices, you know that it's the same thing as what? It's the same thing as finding a short vector in a random lattice inside my previous class. Okay. So if you think about it, you will see that it corresponds to choosing the uniform distribution for these lattices inside the class, and you're asking, so it, 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 it's really a randomized version of the shortest vector problem. Right? I want to find a short vector in this lattice with this distribution. Okay. So so far I didn't say what is the 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 the, the great result. So I hope I didn't forget the slide. Yeah, yeah, I have it. <laughs> So if I take my simplest example, if I take g equal to zq, it means the following problem. Pick m random element, random numbers mark you with uniform distribution. Can you find a solution to this linear congruence? Right? A very simple problem. Okay? So now we know that this is the same as finding a short lattice vector for random lattices such that the torus is isomorphic to zq. Okay? So now I can finally say, what is Aitai's theorem? So Aitai's theorem says that if you know how to solve this problem on the average, so for random group elements, then Aitai can use your algorithm to find short vectors in every n-dimensional lattice. Okay. So that, that's why I mean. So why is it so important? So, in complexity, usually, we have two types of reduction. There is worst to worst case. So you assume that you have a machine that can solve that can solve all the instances of one problem. Then can, you can use this machine to solve all the instances of another. Problem. So this is what is used in NP Harner's result. And then sometimes what you have is average to average reduction. So suppose that you, are, you have a way to solve a random instance of one problem, then you can solve a random instance of another problem. Okay, so that's what we have often in cryptography. What we very seldomly have is a worst case to average case reduction. So if we can solve weekly a problem on the average, it's enough to solve every instance of another problem. So if we believe that this problem is hard in the worst case, that means that this problem is hard on the average. And that's something I think that is really special, a problem for which random instances are hard. When I, when I give you an NP-hard problem, you have no idea how to generate hard instances. It doesn't come, it doesn't come with the instruction. You know, you know there are some hard instances, but you have no clue how to generate them. Okay. So this theorem of Aitai can be generalized to any sequence of finite abelian groups, provided that the order grows sufficiently fast, OK? So uh, in some sense, this looks like a computational analog of this ergodic result I was telling you. I was telling you that if the sequence grows to infinity, then uh, these integer lattices converge to the uh, real distribution. And now we know that it also has some uh, hardness property. Okay? So that is quite surprising. That would be too small. You have, you, you, like two to the n doesn't grow fast enough. Yeah, so. Oh, here it's z two z to the power n. So this is um, this is a coding theory problem. 
I think it's still a coding problem. Yeah, so this is too small. 3 to the n is not. So it, it has to be, uh, yeah, yeah, super exponential. And uh, yeah, so that brings back to what uh, Philip was asking. Like, if the entries are too small, then the problem might be easy, and so that's what's going on. If the volume, if the call volume is too small, uh, some problem become, uh, become easy, even for the harder in general. Okay, so we have this wonderful ITI result. Uh, so one thing that people love to do when you have a nice thing is to, uh, to look at the dual, uh, dual approach, okay? So let's, let's put duality now into these problems. So the, the lattice I was working with is, remember, I pick some group elements in my finite building group and I consider the lattice formed by all the solution all the relations between these group elements, all right? So what happens if I take the dual lattice of that lattice, okay? Well, it turns out that the dual lattice of that lattice with my definition of dual lattice is related to the dual group of my group. So usually when you, you talk about dual group, you, 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 you talk about complex, uh, uh, you're going to map to the unit circle, but instead, because I'm using additive notation, I want to switch the torus. So to me, here, only in this talk, the dual group will be the, the group formed by all the morphism from G to the torus, to the one-dimensional torus. Okay. So if I take that definition, you can see it's a basic uh, fact that the dual lattice of that lattice is just the vectors which correspond to evaluating some character at every group element. So it's a set of all the yi's such that there exists some character such that for every i, a yi is congruent to s evaluated at gi mod 1. Okay? So a lattice point in the dual corresponds to a character. So of course there's there's only finitely many characters, so there's a scaling, there's a, like there's a translation. So modulo one, if it's true modulo one, you pave the whole, the whole lattice, okay? So for the special rela relation lattice, the dual lattice correspond to characters of, of the group, okay? So, so 10 years later, Odad Regev define the following problem. You pick as i tie n group elements uniformly at random from the, from the group, and you pick a random character in the finite dual group. Okay? And now here's the problem. Can you recover this character if I give you the group elements, and so I have to give you something with respect to the, to, the, to, the, to the character. I take all the evaluation of the character at the group elements, but I'm adding some noise, okay? So I'm adding some noise to this torus element, okay? So you can see that this is exactly, this is exactly bound and distance decoding in the dual lattice of the i tie lattice, okay? So this is the problem. Now you could ask, what is the noise? How do you perturbate is, uh, this, these quantities? So remember, each S of G1 is an element of the torus R divided by Z, okay? So the, the most natural uh, choice would be a Gaussian noise. So what is a Gaussian noise? You take the Gaussian noise over the real numbers, okay? So you know this well, you know this bell curve. So here are two curves with different standard deviation. This is the density function of the, uh, of the Gaussian distribution. So here is a, is a more, the blue one is a more spread Gaussian than the, than the red one. So if you want to do it over the torus, the, the most natural thing to do would be to add all the densities in the same class, right? So when you do that, this is the curve you obtain. And there's a, there's a smoothing phenomenon that arises 
as you increase the standard deviation of the, the Gaussian, the distribution you obtain, the folded distribution, becomes uniform. So here, the, this red line would be a, for a bigger standard deviation, and the blue one would be for a small standard deviation. It's not the uniform distribution. But if you increase the standard deviation, then it becomes uniform. It's going to become a flat curve. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you.